Hello, I'm Vikram Kimyani. I, I now called a cloud solutions architect and I work for Oracle and I work in the financial services sector. So completely separate to what you guys do. But what I'm hoping to do today is to give you a bit of a, a broad overview of what we're doing. Um, give you an idea of what we see in the market. So I'll be showing you some re research. And most importantly, uh, most importantly, I will show you what our customers have done. So hopefully that will give you an idea of what people have done that's live and actually in use. So let me you can add me on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever takes your fancy. I have to show you this. This is mandatory for all Oracle employees. It's my, I call my get out of jail free card. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are some of our future strategy and direction. And this basically says that if we change our mind, you can't hold me to it. <laughs> okay, so I've already mentioned what I'm going to talk about. So blockchain is a one of a number of technologies, as you can see up on the board. Um, and it's marked here as high business impact in 2020. And that's a year away. That's not very long at all. Uh, and hopefully when I go through this, I'll give you some sort of idea. Some people are saying that it's going to be more like 2030, 2040. But what we're actually seeing is that the market is moving extremely quickly. Um, and of course, you can see the autonomous vehicles right at the top will be highly transformational. So if you're not doing anything in that space, you should do that. This Hello? Is so uh, from sorry, could you please move your mic? Uh, um, could you please share, share the slides? Well, we can't see them remotely. Yeah. Yes, we'll do that. Um, so as you can see, quite a number of technologies. It's, this research is from ASOS, and these slides will be available. So there's a lot of promise behind blockchain. There's a, there's a lot of activity going on. So we've got Gartner, very esteemed uh, research house. They're saying 2026, the business value, so business value is the additional enterprise benefit that they see from using blockchain, either in savings or additional profit, is $360 billion in 2026. Now that's a big number. But they then go on to say 2030, they think that's going to be in the trillions. That's a pretty bold statement to say, even for Gartner. So that's, it gives you an idea of what, what they think and where they think the market's going. And they do this by asking their participant companies what they're spending money on and what they think they're going to achieve. I don't make these numbers up. They, they get these um, by running surveys. Now, IDC <laughs> talked about global spend. Um, so global spend last year, I think that's actually under what the global spend was. So $1.5 billion spent last year on blockchain projects, technologies, um, proof of concepts, you, you name it. And they think that's going to be 11.7 in 2022. That's a huge number. Um, and again, Juniper went and asked a whole bunch of companies, what are you, what are you doing? Are you doing anything in blockchain? Are you actively researching it? Are you, are you, are you doing something? And pretty much, well, the vast majority, 65% have said that they are. Um, and that was, that was last year. That was near the beginning of 2018. So it's going to be higher than that now. And I won't read the quote out, but there's, a, there's also a quote there. And the IDC breakdown of where that spend is, is on this chart. But what's quite important is that CIOs are already heavily engaged. This is across industry. So not just one particular industry, across industry. We've got CIOs already planning, doing things. 43% um, have it on their radar. This research is from 2017. That number is higher now. So it gives you an idea. There's a lot of money being spent in a lot of places, a lot of interest which means that probably something's going to happen it, it, you know, in some point. So we saw all this research and we thought well, we need to do something and we need to be in that space as well. So what we've done uh, is uh, very similar as most other tech providers. We're providing a cloud service. So 
we call it blockchain as a service or platform as a service, whatever you, you like to call it. But, but the idea is we've taken a look at the technologies that were available and we had a look at um, Ethereum, Corda, you, you name it, and we decided that we've got a quite a unique position as a provider. And I'll, I'll show, you, show you a little bit more towards the end and what that position actually looks like. So we provide a lot of software for a lot of companies in a lot of different spaces. So we can take advantage of that to help drive this and bring things forward. And most importantly, we, we can drive the network effect. Um, and the network effect is quite important. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Most companies are not interested in doing any mining. They don't want to do proof of work. It doesn't make sense. If you're running a blockchain network and you're running it on your own computers, in your own data centers, you don't want to have to pay to do mining. That's, that's a definite no. So anyone who was thinking of using a Bitcoin-based blockchain and selling it to a company, that's going to be a no. Right. Most companies want to do business with people that they know. They don't want to do business with people that they don't know. So think about identity. For those taking part in the hackathon, put your hands up. Okay. So think about when you, when you come to look at the use cases and things you're doing later on. Um, companies need to know who they're going to work with. Identity is quite key and important. Um, we decided that we weren't going to write our own blockchain, so we went with an open source solution. And back when we were looking at it, there was only one candidate, and that was Hyperledger. And they had a number of technologies, and we've chosen Hyperledger Fabric. So over the next day and a half, you're going to be looking at that, and we're going to help you, help you with that. For, for those of you um, familiar with other technologies, we'll try and help translate what that means for you as well. And my colleague here as well, Chris, if you raise your hand. So the two of us will be around the next two days, um, and we'll be here to advise you. The other thing enterprises don't want to do is they don't want to manage the software. They don't want to have to worry about standards changing. They don't want to have to worry about managing the network. They just want it to work. So that's, you know, that's, that's very important, but, which is, I know it's bad news for techies because techies love to get into the nuts and bolts of things and run, run their clusters and look at it, but companies don't, typically don't want to do that. Um, so what we've done is we've, we look after that for you. It's, it's, it's a fully managed, we put the word autonomous there because as you saw in that previous graph, it's right up there. So. <laughs> um, what we do is we do the patching, backups, um, high availability, so that actually you just worry about the blockchain application and your smart contracts and the governance of the network. So that's what we're doing as our first, that was our first foray into blockchain. The next thing that we're doing, part of our strategy, is that a lot of companies across industries have very similar use cases. Um, I said I was in financial services, and none of these use cases are financial <laughs> service use cases. But they're they are pretty generic across every other space that we play in. So intelligent track and trace is basically a turnkey application and it's, it's there for uh, supply chain tracking. You know, it's pretty obvious what it, what it does, we hope. And then there's an extension of that. We have provenance tracking. So lot lineage and provenance is again proving the provenance of your source materials. So again, turnkey applications, we've already done the, the smart contracts, we've already done all the fancy dashboards and things like that, so it makes it easier for people to partake in the network. Um, and then again, intelligent cold chain, that's just a specialization of track, track and trace, to, uh, typically using the pharmaceutical and food industry, where temperature is key to the freshness of a product, or in fact, the but uh, medicines don't work if they're stored at a too high temperature. So very, you know, very, very important there. And warranty and usage tracking. So this is recall. This is where if you have an issue with a particular supplier and a particular batch that they've made has a problem, rather than recalling everything that they've supplied you or having to check everything that they've given you, you can just track down exactly where you've used that particular batch in which product. So that's what the warranty and usage tracking applications for. These are cross industry. Um. 
Okay, so customer use cases. We went live with our platform July last year. All these customers that you see up here, uh, they're, all, they're all live production, in use, actual blockchain um, use cases. So these customers are live. So Cargo Smart, I'm going to talk about in a bit. Solar site design is not microgrid, so if you were looking for a microgrid use case, it's not that one, but it's contract management of uh, solar installation. So very, very good. M2O is a, uh, is a large loyalty uh, points provider in Korea, and they manage airline points, hotel points, all that sort of stuff. What they've done is that they've moved their point system onto a blockchain with all of their partners. Um, so I don't know if any of you collect any of these travel points, but you typically get, get, get an update three, four days after you've you stayed at a place, or you've taken a flight and things like this. But this system, what they found was that people were having these different loyalty cards with small amounts of points on them and were not using it and were not engaged. Um, they changed this so that now customers get near real-time updates and they can transfer points between all the partners that are in the system. Um, for them, it's brilliant because it means that their points schemes for all the various individual companies are far more popular because the customers are more engaged and they can prove it and they can show it. Um, again, so we've had electronic invoicing. I'm going to touch on that a little bit later on the next slide, so I won't talk about that now. Um, there is a finance example here. So again, this is very similar to trade finance. So this is about getting um, guarantees. So the Indian oil company need to, I don't know if that means time's out, but <laughs> uh, Indian oil company basically is a multiple parties. There's a bank, there's the Indian oil company, there's someone who wants to buy something, so typical blockchain use case. They're providing bank guarantees, removing all the paperwork, they're changing the three month process into two weeks, which for them is phenomenal. Um, funds transfer, I think everyone knows about payments and uh, within blockchain, so there is a payments example there. Uh, import export documentation and taxing and licensing. Again, that's been, that's been done. Pharmaceuticals, that's cold chain tracking. Um, counterfeit drugs. These companies are live, I, I stress, these are people doing it now. That they're already doing it. And there's a supply chain example I'm going to talk in more detail. Certified origins, this is about provenance and protecting their, their particular brand. Oh, there's another bit there. And of course, it's not just limited to people building their own apps. There are people building apps for other people to use in these various you know, uh, fields, and so it's invoice factoring, etc. Um, these are all, again, live systems. You can go and phone up SoftBank and say, I want to use your blockchain contracts management system, who's on your network, and they'll happily set you up. Okay, so I'm going to give you two, I'm going to talk about two of the examples there. Uh, <coughs> Cargo Smart, they run the ports in Hong Kong, and they had a particular problem in that they were, the ships weren't where they were supposed to be, the containers weren't ready, documents weren't signed off, documents had inaccuracies, uh, mistakes in it, um, ships were leaving without being fully utilised. And so they needed to be able to track this, um, remove all the, the, uh, manual, um, the manual parts of the system, and you'll see how manual it is in a second. Um, so typically to get a container that's already in a port onto a ship, there are 20 bits of paper that need to be signed and passed around. So that's just when the container is already in port, already shipped, and just needs to get onto another ship. So that's a, that's a lot of manual, manual work. So what they've done is that they've switched to the ports that they manage to using a blockchain system. They've improved the utilization of their ships by 50%, and they're already se they've already seen a 5% increase on the bottom line, which is, for them, it's immense. So the payback started. This is basically the problem. This is the problem statement. I'm not going to go in detail. Um, and you can see this, those doing the hackathon, if you want to have a look at the details behind this for your own use case, it's perfectly okay. Um, you can see lots of manual paperwork and interactions between multiple parties. And so their solution was, we just want to solve the documents problem so that we can get the containers onto the ships. And so that's what they did. 
they digitise the documentation, they've got an audit trail, documents can't go onto the blockchain unless they're already correct, remove the, the process of having to go back and uh, say there's a mistake, you need to correct this. Um, and you've seen what the improvements are, utilisations up, bottom line has increased. For them it's a huge, huge success, so successful that they decided that they need to talk to all of their competitors about it and they've launched a shipping business network. They've not called it a consortium because that seems to be a bit of a dirty word. <laughs> um, but basically, they want to standardise what's happening, at least in their part of the world. And you can see that they've got DP World, Hutchinson Ports, so shipping companies involved. Um, and the idea is not for them to get everyone to use their system, but to drive standards, to, to try and drive industry standards, standardisation, Digitization, di digitization, can't even say it. Um, so, so these these are the things they want to do, and also very, very important to build that <coughs> network and that governance structure. That's the benefit of having the network. Everyone's playing to the same rules or agreeing on the rules, and that's probably the hardest thing to do in any, any of these use cases. So, let me give you another one. So, certified origins. They protect a brand called Made in Italy, and specifically extra virgin olive oil. Now, they had a particular problem in that they weren't getting to hear about complaints of their brands until the consumer had tried to use the extra virgin olive oil and found it had been adulterated, wasn't extra virgin olive oil, they didn't know where it went wrong, um, they didn't know where their, their shipments were. Consumers were asking, can you tell me where my, where my olive oils come from? They didn't have any of that information, or rather they did, but all on bits of paper and all rather manual. Um, going to the next slide. So they had five things that they wanted to do. So they were quite ambitious in the things that they thought they could do um, with a blockchain system. So they wanted provenance tracking for the end consumer. So these bottles that you see there, that these are the bottles. The brand is called Bellucci. Unfortunately, not available in the UK. We had a bought a bottle to show you. There's a QR code on the side of the bottle. Uh, consumers can scan that QR code, and it will tell them lots of information about the olive oil. <coughs> them a tasting sheet. And so, before I looked at this use case, I never knew olive oil had a tasting sheet, much like wine. So, depending from the farms and the co op and the area it's grown and how it's grown, the olive oil tastes different. So, you can now scan that and find out before you buy it what, it, what the tasting sheet is like. Um, but also you can track it down to the co-op that the olives have been grown in. And that's quite important for them. Um, and they plan to keep adding to this and exposing more information. Depends what consumers are interested in, but that's, that's the, first, the first run. They needed to get higher visibility of what's going on uh, production-wise, quality and testing. And they were getting that information, but it was too late. So they were having this t testing done uh, on, their, on their shipments. On bits of paper, eventually we'll get down to HQ, but the bottles were already on their way to the retailers. That's a bit too late to say, oh, I've got a bad batch, don't send it, bring it back, and we need to fix it. So, so now they can actually get in uh, a lot quicker, and they can stop problems before they occur. And the other important thing is um, they had an issue with their shippers as well. They didn't know if things were being swapped in and out of their trucks. Um, they didn't know what temperature the trucks were travelling in. So they've added IoT devices to, to, um, you know, in conjunction with their shipping company. So they can track temperature, they can track, track the humidity. They know if the, if the truck stopped, where it stopped. Um, so they have much more visibility of what's going on in, in, their, in their supply chain there. And again, change of ownership and verification. So on the blockchain, mm -hmm. as ownership changes uh, between the various parties, so the co-ops, they have 1,200 farms in their co-ops, so this is not a s small operation. <laughs> um, they know when the oil's been produced, they know when it's been packed, they know when it's reached the shippers, they know when it's got onto the ship, they know when it's got into the port, they know when it's arrived and been checked, and they know when it's got to the retailer. So, so you can imagine that informa there's a lot of information, it's a lot of information to track. They didn't know that before, or they did, 
but it was too late, or much, much after the fact. And paperless logistics, or paperless logistics pretty much helps them with all of the, all, all of the above, and they've successfully done it. So people saying that you can't use blockchain for provenance tracking, if independent small farms in Italy can, can do it, I'm pretty sure everyone else can do it as well. Okay. So how are we lever leveraging our presence in the market? So most of us know us as a database company. We do a lot more than that. We have a lot of customers using uh, planning software, uh, enterprise planning software. So we've got NetSuite, which is used by 40,000 organizations in the world. And these are small, smaller to medium-sized operations. They generate their purchase orders, invoices, etc. They can already integrate and interface with a Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. It's, <coughs> it's a one-click option. It add your blockchain details, you know, add the node that you need to export to. And they are doing this already for in invoice factoring. Um, 319 banks use our software for their core banking uh, um, part. So that's payments, managing accounts, settlements, things like that. Blockchain adapters for that, done. Mandated from the top that all of our applications must have blockchain adapters. What that means is that banks can take part in networks and it doesn't have to be with us. It can be with any blockchain. It, um, a blockchain in itself is not useful unless you can get data in and out of another system. And these are the sorts of things that, that you would need to interface with. Again, we've got an open banking platform, um, and we do have specialist applications in retail, uh, life sciences, health sciences, it says there, construction and engineering. And they, the dotted lines means that we haven't done it yet. The, the non-dotted lines means we have done it. But basically, all applications are mandated to be able to interface to a blockchain to get data into and out of a system or as part of a workflow, which means that actually you don't have to change existing companies' processes to take part or use new technology. And that's quite key, because if you try to change a company's existing process, it's a, immediately that sets off a three-year project alert in somebody's head, and, and um, that will slow things down. But doing it this way means that they can use their existing process, and they can run a new system in parallel. And, there, and there's more. I won't read them all out, but we have a fair number of customers who have been, because I work in financial services, a fair number of customers who are all interested and in all running POCs on blockchain. Um, using our software, they can interface with any, any other blockchain. It doesn't have to be an Oracle one. Uh, it could be anything. And the idea is that we're trying to open up all of the systems to, to form those ready-made networks, and it's those networks that are, that are most important. And for those taking part in the hackathon, the third link, developeroracle.com slash blockchain, is going to be very important for you. It's code samples, examples, smart contracts on there um, will be very useful uh, for Hyperledger Fabric development. And I'm open for questions. Uh, in your Cargo Smart system, how many validator nodes are actually being run live in the system? I think they're running a three or four node system. I don't know exactly for sure. Okay, okay. Um, and my second question is, when it comes to um, putting data onto the blockchain, so for example, uh, for olive oil tracking, yep. how do you ensure the integrity and the quality of the data actually being put into the system, so which could be a, a, a breaking point for the system? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so very important. Garbage in is garbage out. So we don't change our existing system. So it's farms generally in, in the European area are actually very high tech. Don't know if, if you're familiar, they have to log everything. They need certifications, they need to log fertilizers. They need, they're doing this already. They're already using systems. So they're using you know, Excel spreadsheets, they, whatever they're using, they're already doing it. They have to prove that and they have to show that to the inspectors within their country. So we're not changing that. That could still be false, so we don't we don't know that. You can you can never fix that from a blockchain. Um, all you can do is that over time, those who are cheating the system will get caught out. 
because they will get tested at some point. Um, Andrew Lindsay, um, so I, I'm wondering with the companies that you're working with, mm -hmm. um, it seems as though they have sort of a larger capacity, especially from a financial side, to be able to contribute that to Oracle. So in pursuing this effectively democratizing technology, mm -hmm. how do we ensure that essentially the big companies then create these data sil silos that are actually further integrated on their own blockchain systems, which then makes it almost more difficult for the rest of the industry to adapt? Okay, that's an interesting question. So I actually, the examples I gave you, those, those companies, they're not, the, they're not the bigger companies because the bigger companies move a lot more slowly. Um, so Certified Origins is actually a small, small company. They only sell their olive oil in one particular, they only sell it in the USA, for instance. Um, even though they have 1,200 co-ops taking part, most of these are, I would say, medium-sized companies, and they don't want to create silos because they're not the biggest players and it doesn't work in their favor. Um, and I think when you start to see the larger companies come in, um, I'm not going to name any names, but um, some companies will come up and say, I've written a blockchain system and there you go, everyone. Go and use it. Uh, by the way, I run all the nodes <laughs> uh, and own all of the data. That's not going to work. Your competitors are not going to do that. These companies are far more open. And that's, that, and that's why they're in production and they're successful. I think there was a question over there. At the risk of uh, being political, can you solve Max FAC for Northern Ireland and Dover? Let me, let me, tell, let, let, let me tell your story. So last, last year we ran a blockchain hackathon. Um, and it was around public sector government use cases. And we had an, an MP, I'm sure will remain nameless, as one of the judges. And he asked us that very same question. So we created a use case. We had these Raspberry Pis and IoT devices all around our building. And you could walk around and it would trigger an alert saying that this Pi has reached Calais, it's reached Dover, and it would write it onto a blockchain system. None of the participants went near that use case with a barge pole. <laughs> as soon as they saw it, they were like, no way. He was a little bit, the MP was a little bit disappointed. So I think you could do it. The problem is not technology, it's the process and the people. Just a quick one. It's one over. <laughs> I was waiting for um, it. I'm just interested to know why Oracle have made such a big bet on Hyperledger when you've got other competitors who are allowing you to deploy across Ethereum, Quorum, Hyperledger, whatever your choice is. Why, why, why Hyperledger is the focus for Oracle? Okay. The decision process was quite simple. We had to be across industry, <coughs> open source, very important, and it had to be modular. So Hyperledger allows you to change consensus uh, mechanisms depending on the use case. Well, when we looked at the technologies in, I think it's 2016 or 20, uh, 2017, there was only one. There was one choice. Um, well, actually, there were two choices. The other choice was Quorum. The Quorum was owned by JP Morgan, so that ruled it out completely. Um, that's how we arrived at the decision. We, this is, like I say, this is our first step. So we might add others, but we want to get this right first. Hi there, yeah. We're a tier two subcontractor, so we're sort of punching above our weight, but we're really keen to get involved in digital and the future. Um, one of the things as a subcontractor working on projects we find is admin heavy is the FSC requirements, and I've read that it's going to be 2023 before they even think about digitising that whole audit trail of the paperwork and the chain of custody for timber. Yep. Um, it sounds like you've got a quick win off the shelf solution here with the technology that could be dovetailed straight into that part of our construction process and save a big headache. Is, there, is that on the radar for something that's yeah. going to be ahead of that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, certainly storing any kind of documentation, certifications, 
Uh, absolutely. And I'm sure they're already using systems in-house to create that documentation. Yeah. And it would be a matter of just interfacing that. And it, it's actually relatively easy to do that interface. Well, there's a lot of people in, in the FSC chain yeah. that are all different types of companies. Yeah. Um, and you'd need buying from all of them. But I just wonder, do you yeah. see any traction there yet on that? Um, I haven't personally seen, not, not in FSC, mainly because I work in financial services, yeah. but I would not be surprised that they're not already trying to look at technologies like that. We've talked to a number of other government departments and they're all really keen on looking at blockchain technologies, seeing what it could do for their departments, because they're all being driven to, to digitise, to save costs. So. Okay. 2023 seems a long way away. The FSC are talking about that being right. their plan. Sounds like there's a quick win here that I, could be I ahead think, of that. I think if the Italians can do it, we can do it better. <laughs> Sorry, Italians. <laughs> I would like you to substantiate the Italian. <laughs> I'll take it back. Technology start from Italy. Um, but I have a question of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's something being done to protect intellectual property. We're architects, and that's important to us. Okay. So, in terms of IP, personally identify information, the guidance is do not put that onto the blockchain directly. Put in a verifiable signature, hash, watermark, but do not put in the actual property itself because then what you'll do is you'll release it to the, w well, at least the participants, I'll say the world, for free and you don't want to do that. And also, also with things like, particularly around personally identifying information, so with GDPR, with the right to, to be forgotten, you will n never be able to remove that data without breaking fundamentally what blockchain is supposed mm -hmm. to do, which is be a true store of all things that have happened. So IP-wise, you can do it, and I've seen people do it with watermarks, for instance. So here's my design, here's my watermark. I'm storing the watermark, I may even sign that, and this is where the record is actually stored, like where my design is actually stored elsewhere. Um, but the fact that you've done it, recorded it, and own it, it is there and immutable. Does that make sense? Has that answered it? Kind of, but I was, I was looking at, there are some people that actually put stuff on the blockchain to protect the intellectual property itself. I, yeah. Isn't there singers that put their songs so that they can get yes. their... Uh, so how can we do that with designs, for example? So, so you, 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 could, uh, you could do that. So if you want to store that, if you want to store the actual design on there and then sign it and so that it's irrefutably yours, you, you can do that. But again, the advice on a blockchain is not to store large amounts of data. The record of the fact that the data exists. That, so you want to store as little as possible. Okay, last uh, question. Yes, I have. <laughs> All right. Who's, who's that guy? Him. So right. Uh, normally, uh, if you have a private distributed ledger like Hyperledger, the trust in the system comes from distributing the nodes across participants that yep. don't have aligned interests. Um, so there is um, a security that no one cheats the system and changes data on the servers. So now you're putting all these nodes into the Oracle Cloud, as I understand, and they're controlled by Oracle in the end. Um, if I, or maybe you can explain that to me afterwards. I will explain it on. So, how is that different from a normal cloud solution where you kind of replicate data across several servers? Okay. Okay. So, the solution that we're offering is is basically each. So, when you think of a blockchain network, you have participating organisations. They run their own nodes. So, what we're offering is that for a particular organisation within that network, they can host their part of the network on our cloud. It doesn't mean that the entire network should be on our cloud. In fact, it's probably not best practice to do that. It doesn't mean that the entire network should be on, the, on one particular vendor or provider. 
Um, because it's just hyperledger fabric, it's using the same protocols. You can run it, you can connect your laptop to it, you can connect it from your own data center, run it on a different uh, uh, cloud provider. Uh, but the part that you own, we hopefully, we've, we think we've made it easy for you to manage that part 